Welcome to another episode of Pro Style Podcast. For the latest episode, go to ProStylePodcast.com, grab some merch, check out the blog. Let me know what you guys think about the website. Is it cool? Is it not? I mean, just let me know. Give me some type of feedback. On today's show, we got an Alabama legend, an <laughs> Auburn legend, the pride and joy of Decatur, Alabama. We got my guy, Gerard Power. How you doing, bro? My guy, what's up? What's up? Glad I can finally be on, man. Yeah, man. You know what? In high school, there's this this fab list of the top 20 players in the state that come out. 20, 25 players. And I'll never forget looking at their list. And I'm like number 18, right? Like I'm way at the bottom, like 18. <laughs> Up in that top five, top 10, top five, top 10, my man Gerard Power. The number one corner, number one DB in the state. Yeah, 5'8", 150 pounds. At 5'8", 150. <laughs> what made your game so special in high school? Uh, man, uh, to be honest, I think I, I was kind of aware of what my weaknesses were at a young age. Like, I knew I wasn't going to be tall, but I knew I was quick. I knew I could use that to my advantage. And then um, – you know, just being a young guy started early on varsity, I kind of had to learn ways to win certain matchups. You know, I remember yeah. going against like Jason Swain and Chad Jackson, mm. Chad uh, Jackson and all those guys that was the like top receivers in the country and they were all bigger guys. So I kind of learned how to, you know, use my body in certain situations to kind of uh, give me an advantage. And it kind of just stuck with me through high school, all the way through college and even in the NFL. You know, I was always a smaller type guy, but uh, but could just hold my own versus anybody because I was aware of my weaknesses. Now, let's talk about that. High school, you said you went against Chad Jackson, who was uh, probably one of the best players to ever play in high school. Ever play in high school. <laughs> I mean, that guy was phenomenal. He caught two touchdowns against us. He ran one and he threw one. And he ended up signing at the University of Florida. And then you got Jason Swain. Uh, again, a top recruit, wide receiver, ended up going to the University of Tennessee. And to be able to play against those guys at an early age, you kind of – it was already written in, in so many words that you would have the opportunity, you know, bearing any, you know, catastrophic injury, that you would have the opportunity to play in the NFL because both of these guys, you know, they had their shot. How did you, how did you feel once you saw those guys go to the league? Man, no lie. Uh, my sophomore year was a senior years, and that was like the first time in my life I probably had somebody really wake me up and be like, man, you got an opportunity to play on the next level just because of uh, my little small success that I had versus those guys. Now, I'm not saying I shut those guys down. I think when we played Hoover that year, uh, I did pretty good on Chad Jackson, but he ended up running like a 60-yard punt return back for the <laughs> game winner or something like that, and then Jason Swain, he was at Grissom and Decatur, and that was kind of a rival a little bit. And uh, we kind of went back and forth a little bit. But I, I held my own as a sophomore, and that kind of started the whole recognition of, you know, people saying, man, you, if you take football serious, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to play on the next level and, you know, things are like that. And then when those guys went on to have those great careers in the SEC, uh, being top receivers in the SEC and uh, going on to play in the NFL, I want to say Chad got drafted first pick of the second round, I think, to uh, New England or something like that. And uh, seeing them do that and knowing, like, man, this guy's in the NFL that I covered in high school, I know I can get there as well. So it kind of opened my eyes a little bit. Top player in the state, top DB in the state. What made you choose the University of Auburn? I mean, it, because it, honestly, you know, Alabama, they typically get all the best players right. in the state. Um, I thought I was going. I thought I was going to Bama. Um, okay. Man, I, a lot of people don't remember. One of my best friends, he played safety for us. His name was Sam Bernthal. He, he actually signed with Alabama. Same year, same class. And everybody thought I was going too. And how the story went was um, when we went on my official visit to Alabama, you know, they kind of buttered my mom up. They knew my mom was going to be the uh, the selling point. <laughs> she really didn't like Bama just off of the history of yeah. Alabama not wanting blacks to play there at one point yeah. and all the other things from back in the day. You know how the South is. They hold oh. on to grudges forever. Oh, uh, forever. So, 
Yeah, so my mom already didn't want me to go to Bama, but when we went to Tuscaloosa, she had a great time. And then I had, like, cousins, best friends. I had everybody in Tuscaloosa. And, yep. you know, in <laughs> high school, that was the spot. You was going to go to Alabama. You was going to go to T-Town on the weekend. Everybody. <laughs> so I, I just knew I was going to go to Alabama. But uh, when we left, I actually told Mike Shula, who was a coach at the time, I was like, look, man, I'm going to commit. I would do it today, I said, but I got to go to Auburn next week because they've been loyal to me as well. Yeah. And uh, I went to Vanderbilt as well, went to Vanderbilt as well. But I said, man, I got to go to Auburn. I promised them a visit, and I'm going to announce everything after my Auburn visit. Mm-hmm. Auburn caught wind of uh, what happened with my mom because she, she told that to Mike Shuler. She's like, I just don't feel comfortable with my son being here, you know, mm-hmm. the history of Alabama. You know, and all that type of stuff. I remember being embarrassed in the in the uh, in his office <laughs> and everything when my mom said it. But Auburn caught wind of it, and as soon as we got to Auburn, they put Brother Chet, who is a pretty famous chaplain at Auburn, pretty well known uh, chaplain. Uh, mm-hmm. So they put Brother Chet with my mom, and I ain't see her the entire weekend at Auburn. <laughs> and uh, and on the visit at Auburn. They were getting ready to play Virginia Tech. So it was during December when nobody – it was uh, Christmas break. Nobody was in school. Probably the worst visit I had because uh, mm. it was just nothing to do. It was just the football players on campus. And, you know, you go on your visits. You want to see the football stuff, but you can't, you're trying to get out into town. You're really trying yep. to, you know, have a taste of that college life. Right. Uh, so I remember when we left, I, I looked at my mom. I was like, yeah. I said, so we good with Alabama? I said, I'm really cool with either one. I said, both good schools, good academics. Uh, I was like, Auburn got a better program at the at the moment. I said, but it is Alabama, you know, at the end of the day. And my mom just was like, oh, no, like, I, it's just something about Auburn. I just feel so <laughs> comfortable if you go there. And, you know, she gave me that whole spill. And that's kind of how I ended at Auburn. <laughs> Man, that is awesome. It, it See, that's the thing about, like, recruiting. You got to know who you have to, you know, really attack. Nice, you know, like, to say, like, <laughs> Is it the mom? Is it the dad? Is it the brother? Like, there's always one person that you really need to hit on. And if you that's get true. that person, you're golden. You know? <laughs> no, that's true. No, if, that's true. If you're, if you're purely just solely going out the, the, the player himself, you're, you're not going to get the player. You got to find, find out who is it. Like, who is it? Is it the mom, dad, brother? <laughs> but yeah, Because, you know, with the players, you know, with you being a top recruit as well, with the players, you grow up, you might be a fan of somebody, but once you kind of open your eyes right. to other universities, you kind of put them all on the same level. Like, man, well, you. you know, everybody was saying that this program was better than that program, but when I visited, it was almost the same thing, you know? Right. So you, you just start to see the little things, like on my visit to Vanderbilt. I thought Vanderbilt was probably my best visit, had the most fun ever. And the, my only reason of not going was I just didn't want to be a part of a rebuilding process, which that was their their selling point to come yeah. in. They they had just had they had you in that same recruiting mm-hmm. class. You let me, you let they me wanted know. everybody to come in and be a part to change that whole program around, which you went and done that. Like you went there, broke every SEC record. You let me and, know. And, and yeah, and, and, and kind of put and Vanderbilt the on you, the map. And here's why you let me down. We was on a visit at the same time. We was partying, having fun. Yeah, had a great time. I got had another. I got another Bama boy here with me. You know, we we gonna that come change the culture. We gonna come make this thing yep. right. And coach then, Caldwell was my recruiting coach. Yep, he was my recruiting coach. Too. <laughs> my and then guy. We get the signing day. He just you just leave us hanging, man. Oh, and man. believe it or not, like like how you say you're supposed to know who to attack. My high school coach was an Auburn grad, and mm. no lie, I had so many coaches come in to visit me to where he like certain coaches. He'll just be like, "Yeah, come come to the lunchroom, and we'll talk for 30, <laughs> 45 minutes, and then that'll be it with that coach." But every time yeah. Auburn came, yeah. I was out of school from eight to like two o'clock, <laughs> just at the field house talking yeah. to the Auburn coach. Yeah, see, that's how I was with Kentucky. They call they call my dad. And it was like, hey, yeah, we uh we about to grab lunch with your dad. And I was like, is that legal? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, all right, well, I'll come grab some lunch too. You know, it was like, I ain't right. really doing much. <laughs> but when they, I was actually, I was going to Kentucky. I was sold. Where they messed up at, they told me that I would start at safety and then move to corner. And I was like, wait, I'm, I thought I was signing as a receiver. And they were Man. like, nah. We want you to play safety. And that was it. 
that did it for me. That Dang, was the, that for was, real. That was the end of it. Like I didn't even it. know you had DB skill. Nope, you never mind. I I did remember you did mm-hmm. have some DB skills because yeah. there was some other schools that wanted you as a DB too, right? Yep. So Notre Dame came out and they was like, "Hey, man." We want you to play safety. I was like, Charlie Weiss, I don't know, man. I really don't know. He was like, no, you'll be great. Trust me. And if you don't, if you don't do well at safety, we'll move you to corner. I was like, dang, the second spot would be corner. Like <laughs> I can't go back to the offensive side of the ball. And he was just like, not really. You know, if that don't work, we'll beef you up, put you at linebacker. And I was just like, this is going too far. Goodness gracious. And I just told, and I told Coach Weiss, I was like, hey, man, I appreciate it, but I'm probably not coming to your school. And he was like, son, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. And I'm, I'm in Spanish. It's funny. I'm in Spanish class. And, and, and I'm on the phone with him, and I go, hey, Coach, I appreciate it. I need to get back to Spanish class. <laughs> and I hung up. <laughs> And like that was, that was my last time talking to Charlie Wise. So man, them you know, man, stories is crazy. You have to you have to know who to really, you know, attack and entice. And they have Kentucky had my dad. It was it was a foregone conclusion. I was going to be a wildcat and it just it failed. But so you leave the University of Auburn. We ain't gonna talk about how y'all double cover me in college. We'll, we'll skip that. <laughs> University I got you on my list as like some of the top guys I covered, and I, I claim that I locked y'all up, but we, had, we really, we really had like a double cover type scheme. I, I didn't do nothing that game. I was mad. <laughs> you leave the University of Auburn, and you get drafted by the Colts, third round. How did you feel going into an organization that was, you know, really at the top of the league at the time? Man, it was unique. Uh, for one thing, I was blessed enough to go to an organization to where I could just come in and be me. I didn't have, like, no pressure on me. Hmm. Uh, I mean, you already had the leaders in place. The tradition was in place. The only thing you had to do was come in and follow the guidelines. And if you didn't, Bill Polian normally got you out of the building. Like, if you didn't fit the locker room, fit the culture, you know, I, I mean, I saw my – the uh, I, dang, I forget the guy's name. He was a fourth-round draft pick, same class as me. Uh, for the coach, and they cut him at training camp, and oh, I was just goodness. like, "Oh, yeah!" And I, and you know, that's rare. Like that yeah. don't happen. And, they, uh, they so, funny. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I was blessed enough to go to an organization who already won a Super Bowl, who was competing for championships, who had arguably the best quarterback in in the history of football. You had the White Franny and Robert Mathis on the edge. You had. Um, uh, Antoine Bethea in the secondary, Kelvin Hayden, Marlon Jackson. You know, you had so many veterans to where I just came in and just fit. And those guys looked out for me. Um, like, I wasn't hazed, didn't have to go through that process. You know, they treated me, uh, you know, like a man. And in return, they just wanted me to give 100% to football. So I was just blessed enough to come to an organization that really didn't have any baggage or didn't have any wrongdoings. You know, you just come in and do what you had to do. And I was blessed enough to win the starting job. And uh, be an opening day starter as a rookie, which was rare for that organization as well, too. Yeah, opening day starter as a rookie. But we got to talk about these training camp battles. Two Hall of <laughs> Famers, Reggie Wayne, Marvin Harrison, quarterback Peyton Manning. How, how did you hold your own, like, mentally going into practice? How did you get into that zone knowing that every day you got to go out here and you got to compete your butt off? with two of the greatest receivers all time? Uh, The one thing I learned quickly was when Peyton Manning and Reggie and Dallas Clark and all those guys, when they were catching balls from Peyton, you could have the best coverage in the world and still don't understand how he caught it, how he (laughs) got it in that specific area, like the whole nine. So I learned quickly like that in the NFL, every centimeter matters, like (laughs) every inch, every step, you know, it matters. And kind of how I kind of won my job in training camp was uh, I had a couple good days, like the first week, had a good week versus the threes and the fours, um, you know, when we first came in. And then Bill Polian comes to me one day and he was like, hey, I want you, I want you to go wherever Reggie Wayne goes. You know, every one-on-one rep, you need to go against them. And every time you can go against them in team drills, you need to be in front of Reggie Wayne. And uh, not saying that I shut Reggie Wayne down because he reminds me all the time. He got every one-on-one <laughs> footage of me and him. Uh, but I ended up having two picks uh, that day, had, a, had two picks on Peyton. And uh, I remember we was getting ready to play Minnesota Vikings, Adrian Peterson, the first preseason game. And Bill Poland walked up and said, 
Uh, this is in warm-ups, by the way. Uh, as we were stretching as a team, walked up and said, like, you're, you're starting tonight. Let's see what you got. Nice. And, in, and instantly, I didn't think of not one receiver because Percy Harvin had just got drafted there, and we yep. had just had so many battles in college. So I really mm-hmm. wasn't worried about Percy, even though Percy is still one of the toughest receivers I face in the NFL and college uh, yeah. ever. Uh, but I was worried about Adrian Peterson. Out of all the great <laughs> backs that we faced in the SEC, he was the only one that I was just like, man, if he come my way, it might be the first time I shy away from a hit. And, you know you know me playing against me. Like, I didn't shy away from tackles. So, yeah, uh, that, that's kind of how that story went with my first training camp. Yeah, because Adrian Peterson, look, I mean, granted, Darren McFadden, you know, Felix Jones. Aiden Hillis. Aiden Hillis, like, Felix Jones. That was a three-headed monster like that. I don't know how Arkansas had all three of those guys. At one time. time. <laughs> but Nuts. other than tackling those guys, and, and they, I mean, they don't really stack up to Adrian Peterson because, you know, in the division, we face the Vikings every year. Right. And, man, watching him come downhill, it was scary. It was scary. Yeah, it was. It was scary. Like, nobody <laughs> wants to be in the way of this guy, man. But you leave the Colts. You go to the Cardinals. How was it playing in the Red Sea? I know a lot of people enjoy playing in Arizona. They love the weather. They say the organization is first class. How was it playing there? Man, it was fun. Um, going to Arizona, I had to get used to it being like a retirement area to where mm-hmm. – you normally don't have many people that's actually from Arizona living there. It's like always people from Chicago, people from out of town. And uh, I remember we played the Cowboys, uh, the, one of the first preseason games I was there, and it was more Cowboys fans than the stadium and Cardinals <laughs> fans. So that's when, we, that's when I kind of knew, like in Bruce Arians, he was a first-year coach there, and we kind of yeah. was like, man, we got to change the culture around here. But uh, when I got to AZ, we had drafted uh, Tyron Matthews, so we had matched up like me. Tyron Matthew, Patrick Peterson, yeah. uh, Curtis Taylor from LSU, Rashad Johnson, Javier Arenas. Like, yep. all, it was like an all SEC. SEC. Uh, DC room. <laughs> so it was kind of fun because uh, me and Rashad Johnson was actually the oldest people in the room at the time. And we were only in our fifth years. Uh, so we were still young. But you had Pat P, who was like a second year player at the time, Tyron, yep. who was a rookie, Javi was like a third year player. And, um, and we was kind of looked at at the old head. So we used to walk in like every stadium, every practice. We used to have that little SEC, I'm better than you, <laughs> little, little attitude about us. And people hated it. Yeah. But it kind of helped change the culture because we were so tight as a defense, so tight as a core. Right. Uh, that we went on one 10 games that year. The next year we go to the NFC Championship, win 12 games. And then the next year we went, we went 13 and 3 and yeah. lost in the NFC Championship again. Yeah. No, you guys definitely changed the culture. I mean, when you think about all those defensive backs that play, you know, in the SEC, a lot of people don't like to admit it, man. But the SEC is the best conference. Like, Period. Yeah. Period. Me and George Reister got a podcast that called The Power Five Fight that we argue about that. And he has the SEC ranked, like, third on his list as best conference. And what? I'm like, it's a reason why there's 100 SEC players that get drafted every what? year. It's like, I can't wait, wait, even wait. argue anymore. Obviously, he has the ACC up there. Don't tell me he, he had, got the Pac-12. He had the big. He had Big Ten as one, and I, he might have had SEC as two. But he said it was close with the SEC and Big Twelve because he was mm-hmm. like the Big Twelve got the best quarterbacks, best offenses, and our oh, offenses and the SEC are horrible and defenses yeah. are overrated. Do he not see <laughs> what we do when we play against those conferences? But those That's what I'm offenses. Him. I told shut him. it down. Like, it, it just it shuts down. Like, yeah, I, I told him, I said, now we got three teams. I said, we probably got – we're two teams away from being top to bottom, everybody. Like, Vandy now is consistently competitive. Yeah. Kentucky consistently competitive. Very true. Arkansas has Very been true. getting beat up the past few years, so I can't really speak on them. But all the teams that you really used to get beat up is getting better and better every year now. So, where I'm like, man, the conference from top to bottom is legit. Yeah. So, breaking news last week, Patrick Peterson hit with a suspension for PED. Do you think that changes his legacy? Do you think it, do you think it messed with his status as a future Hall of Famer? 
I do, I do not. I mean, the guy is eight for eight right now, eight years, yeah. eight straight Pro Bowls. And with this situation, I'm really not sure what the actual thing was. What I was told was it was something that um, that was masked or, or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't think that it, it does anything. Uh, I actually talked to him afterwards, and I think it lit another fire up under him. He, he can, he's already talking about what he's going to do with the games that he's got <laughs> remaining and what he's going to prove to everybody because uh, he said he was kind of pissed off how the whole situation unfolded and how it, how it was handled because he thought that uh, it shouldn't have been a failed test. So yeah. I think it's actually some motivation uh, on his plate now. I think maybe the last couple years, you know, they haven't been too good and he's been doing his job. But um, I think maybe he might might have gotten complacent here and there, even though he's still been putting up great <laughs> Hall of Fame numbers, and yeah. which is crazy, you know, right. just to think that, you know, he, go, he probably goes into certain games just knowing he's not going to get a ball thrown at him. Right. And now with a little extra motivation, I think we might see even a better Patrick Peterson uh, for the future. Uh, so I don't think it's going to uh, do anything. I think, you know, obviously he can't make a, a pro bowl or all pro this year because of uh, the rules when you're suspended or whatnot. But don't be surprised if he run off, you know, five more all pros and, <laughs> and pro bowls right after this season. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's one of the difficult things a lot of people don't understand is that the list of banned substances is, I mean, it's Crazy. the Euphrates River. Like, it is just so long that it, it's hard to really know and understand everything that's on that list. And then you're buying, let's say, a chocolate milk from a gas station, exactly. and you drink it, and you, it, nobody is checking the labels, you know? And I think that's one of the hardest things as a professional athlete is like, you always have to be conscious of what you're putting in your body, but it's just so hard sometimes because you really don't have the, you know, like opportunity or the luxury to think like, hey, in my chocolate milk, there may right. be a banned substance. And so I don't think it affects his legacy. I think uh, a lot of people uh, within, you know, like the NFL Ram and the media will look at this situation and just say, you know, here's another athlete who wasn't careful with what he was taking and you know, yeah. go from there. But I, I personally think that he, he, he'll he be fine. So let, let's switch gears a little bit because Pro Style looks at the symmetry between hip-hop and sports. If you had one more game and you were playing tomorrow, Sunday night, is there one song that you'll go to? Ah. Uh. Sunday night game, man. Sunday you know, night Sunday game. night, the Sunday night primetime playlist a little different than the, the, the one o'clock <laughs> kickoff on Sundays. Uh, if I had one song to go to yeah. Sunday night, it would probably be on some Jeezy Thug 101 motivation, Rick Ross. There uh, we I, go. I, norm I normally go back to the 2005 2009 uh -oh. era uh -oh. when I'm really getting ready for a game I mean that was yeah. like prom era in college and uh I mean I like all the new stuff don't get me wrong I love all the new stuff but you know when it's that that prom time game and you're really trying to get your mind right you always go to that one you know it's gonna get it there and it might be that Jeezy uh thug 101 motivation yes sir Jeezy set the scene on fire when he came out man then we saw him just, you know, continue to elevate his game week in and week out. And he just, I mean, he just, he's a legend, man. He's a down south legend. I like what? the new song he got with Ross on uh, DJ Khaled's new album. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah him, and, him and Ross on the same track. They, I know they beat for a while. Yeah. They missed <laughs> out on a lot of money they could have made man. back in 2005. <laughs> man, a lot of money. A lot of money. So, so that's interesting. We just talked about beef a little bit with Jeezy and Rick Ross. What's the symmetry that you see between hip hop and sports? Man, I think, um, man, that's funny. That's a great question because everybody in hip hop, you know, wish they could be an athlete. That all the athletes wish that they could be <laughs> a hip hop artist. I just yeah. think, I just think it's the competitive nature of it all. I think hip hop is the only genre within music to where the competitive nature part is out there. Like even in R and B, you don't like even though I know it's competition, but everybody can kind of make their lane in all the other genres and where where you're not really competing with nobody. But in hip hop, everybody seems to compete with everybody in sports, no matter if you best friends or not, if y'all play the same position or on opposite mm -hmm. teams, 
you know, you're competing at the end of yeah. the day and you want to do, you want to perfect your craft to let people <laughs> know that you're the best in the business. And then hip hop is the same way. Like if you're yeah. a rapper, you're going to claim that you're the best rapper in the world. If you're a, um, a hip hop R&B artist, you're going to claim you're the best hip hop R&B artist in the world. So I, j I really think it's just the competition part. Uh, that brings the two close together because no matter what you do in both uh, sports and in hip hop, at the end of the day, you're competing with somebody. Yeah, you're competing, like we just mentioned earlier with Reggie Wayne, Marvin Harrison. Yep. Yep. You just, you just same want team to competing for the same Hall of Fame. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Hey, you trying to be in the Hall of Fame? Well, so am I. Let, let, let's get to this exactly. line of scrimmage. And man, that, that was wonderfully put. It's always great catching up with you, man. It, it, my God. It really is, my man. God. My guy, you show up here with your, with your Auburn shirt on, with your Auburn yeah. photo in the background. And Do Vandy, Vandy send you stuff? I know you're a legend. I ain't know if they, you know, I don't know how y'all rock over there. It's been a while, man. Did. It's been a while. <laughs> I need to call some people over there. I, I, ain't, had, I ain't had no, no legit gear, right? I've hey, had man, some gear, but I actually legit. trained a quarterback that just signed that he was there this spring. Uh, early signee Jamil uh oh, nice. number seven the freshman yeah. quarterback he gonna end up being a good player for y'all yeah well hey we lost Kyle Shermer we need somebody to step in and you know lead the offense so hopefully he can do that man but hey how can the people follow you on social media man on all on, on all platforms J Powers 25 uh Instagram Twitter uh Facebook page is Gerard Powers obviously um, Team Freeze it's the foundation you can follow that we do a lot of giveaways help out in the community uh, continue to do what we can to just be a resource to everybody and try to make the next generation the next best one so uh, you can hit me up for anything my man shout out to Earl man this podcast you got him blowing up man mm, and I appreciate we, we it kinda, we kind of saw you do it from the bottom all on your own with no help so yeah, that's man. big ups man because we're all trying to do the same thing yeah, man. Hey, and your podcast, too. Go on pub that. Yeah, Power 5 Fight. Uh, me and George Reister, we kind of just getting things off the road. Already got uh, episode one that we'll be releasing soon. And it's just a podcast talking about all the Power 5 conferences and the pros and cons of each conference. Big matchups between each conference and a little little NFL stories included in, uh, in, e in each episode. So we'll be doing that on Wednesdays, releasing it on Thursday or Friday. Uh, still putting everything together, but you'll see that on all, all the platforms as well. There we go, man. That's my guy, Gerard Powers, man. I appreciate you for rocking our pro style today, bro. No doubt. Thank you, bro. Yes, sir.